You're listening to episode number five of the Keto Diet Podcast. Hey, I'm Leanne from healthfulpursuit.com, and this is the Keto Diet Podcast, where we're busting through the restrictive mentality of a traditional ketogenic diet to uncover the life you crave. What's keto? Keto is a low carb, high fat diet where we're switching from a sugar burning state to becoming fat burning machines. The keto diet has helped me with fertility, has ended my constant weight struggles, blood sugar regularities, imbalanced moods, and so, so much more. I want to share this magic with you using a realistic approach to this powerful diet. No restriction, new ways of looking at things, and positive support awaits. Let's get this party started. Hey guys, I hope you're having a wonderful Sunday. I wish I was out camping right this moment, but I'm not, and I'm sad. We actually just got home from a camping trip, which was amazing. All we did was sit by the fire and chat and listen to music. It was so great. The dogs just nap the entire time and then they come home and they're so crazy. I had to keep them in Kevin's office. Otherwise they'd be running back and forth in the halls right now. So thankfully they're up there with Kevin. So we can have some fun on today's podcast, starting off with the awesome thing this week. I am obsessed with Nuco coconut wraps. I love them. They're so good. They're raw, gluten-free, corn-free, soy-free, dairy-free, egg-free. There's no need to refrigerate them or freeze the wraps. And the reason I'm mentioning this is because when we were camping, all I did was cook up a bunch of meat at home because it's such a pain to cook meat when you're out and about and camping and doing all the things. And then I just put all of the meats in the wraps and wrap them up and dip them in mayo and other sauces that I was making. They're just really, really easy. So If you're looking for a keto-friendly coconut type of wrap thing, it doesn't really taste like coconut to me, but I'm pretty sure I lost my taste buds for coconut. I just don't even taste it anymore because I eat it so much. But you can get more information by going to newcoconut.com. So we're going to be covering the following items in today's episode, including why weight loss focused diets don't work, steps toward body acceptance, how to deal with negative beliefs and comments about your body, body acceptance for children, signs of disordered eating, and more. The show notes for today's episode can be found at healthfulpursuit.com forward slash podcast forward slash E5. And let's hear from one of our awesome partners. The podcast is sponsored by Paleo Valley, 100% grass-fed beef sticks, my new favorite gut-friendly clean protein snack. There are tons of new snack options on the market today, but nothing quite like Paleo Valley's grass-fed beef sticks. They are made from 100% grass-fed and grass-finished beef, which is really rare, contains all organic spices, are all free of dyes, and are also carb-free, GMO-free, gluten-free, dairy-free free, soy free, and contain zero grams of sugar. But the big reason these beef sticks make me do the happy dance is that they're fermented. Yes, just like fermented vegetables. As a result, each beef stick contains 1 billion naturally occurring gut healing probiotics. They're super convenient, delicious, and great for your gut, so don't miss out. Exclusive to our listeners, Paleo Valley is providing 20% off all orders for a very limited time. You'll also be given first dibs on their brand new, insanely delicious garlic summer sausage and summer sausage flavors just like healthy mini hickory smoked sausages. Get your fermented 100% grass-fed beef sticks for 20% off by going to paleovalley.com forward slash keto. Load up your cart and the discount will be automatically applied. Again, that's paleovalley.com forward slash keto. I have absolutely no announcements this week. A lot of fun things happening. Definitely be sure to check back on the blog, healthfulpursuit.com, 
on November 2nd because I have a very exciting thing happening. So if you go there on November 2nd, you'll see it and you'll be excited and you'll love it. And I'm very excited to share it with you next episode. If you have an idea for a podcast episode or you want to submit praise over and above your review that you already left for the show, right? <laughs> you can reach me at info at keto diet podcast.com. And let's read a review really quick. Okay. It comes from Lolo 101 exclamation point. Oh, very excited. <laughs> Leanne is so incredibly knowledgeable about everything keto. It almost seems that if I have a question or a problem, she has most likely already addressed it in her podcast. I really appreciate how in this podcast, there is a focus on body love and positivity. I've listened to a lot of other podcasts about the keto diet and none of them even come close to her level of understanding understanding about the female body, the intricate workings of the mind body connection, and much more. I highly recommend this podcast and all of Leanne's books and videos for that matter to anyone who is looking for a deeper understanding of their health and wellness. So very awesome and such perfect timing because today's podcast is going to blow your mind, I hope. To leave a review and support my show, you can go to healthfulpursuit.com forward slash review and you'll be directed to a page where you can submit your review. Click on reviews and write a review. Give me five stars, hopefully, and write something nice. Or you can go to your favorite podcast app and search for the Keto Diet Podcast and submit your review over there. Okay, so before I introduce today's guest, I wanted to chat about intuitive eating and health at every size because I get a lot of questions from many of you about how I know what's best for my body. And it's a really long answer. <laughs> and our guest today does a really good job at explaining how me, Leanne, am able to know exactly what my body needs and when. So now that I'm on the other side of intuitive eating and health at every size, and this has been a long, long journey for me, I realized and have continued to practice a ketogenic diet. Well, a ketogenic like diet, I like to say, because it's not like the traditional ketogenic diet, as most of you guys have already come to realize. This whole knowing of what my body needs and when it needs it and whether fasting works for me or doesn't started with intuitive eating. And within intuitive eating, there are layers of self-acceptance, connecting to what your body needs, having compassion for yourself and others, and so much more. So now that I'm on the other side of it and gone through all of this work, my intuitive eating practice has led me to what I now call being fat-fueled. So it's a compassionate approach to using fat to fuel your body while not prescribing to the perceived quote unquote right way to follow a ketogenic diet. So I invited Christy Harrison, MPH, RD, CDN, who is a registered dietitian nutritionist and certified intuitive eating counselor based in Brooklyn, New York to chat all about this very topic. She offers online intuitive courses and individual nutrition therapy to help people make peace with food and their bodies. Christy began her career as a journalist in 2003 and has written for and edited major publications including Gourmet, The Food Network, Slate, BuzzFeed, Modernist Cuisine, All Recipes, and many others. As an expert on nutrition and people People's relationships with food. She has been quoted in top media outlets including Refinery29, Health, Men's Fitness, Bon Appetit, The Observer, and more. She currently writes Refinery29's nutrition advice column, How to Eat, and hosts Food Psych, a podcast that explores intuitive eating, health at every size, and body positivity. You can check out Christy's work at christyharrison.com and take her quiz for a free checkup of your relationship with food. And I'll include all of those links in the show notes. So let's cut over to today's interview. Hey, Christy, how are you doing? Hey, Leanne, I'm doing great. Thanks. How are you? I'm fabulous. I was saying just earlier before we started recording, it's so strange to hear your voice because I listen to your podcast all the time, but now it's directed at me. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, it's so great. I'm happy to be on and talking to you directly this time. Totally. So we've had many amazing questions for you gathered by our listeners. But before we dive in, for listeners that may not be familiar with your work, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? 
Sure, yeah. So I am an anti-diet dietitian and an intuitive eating coach. And my podcast is called Food Psych. And I talk with people about their relationships to food, their eating habits and eating disorder recovery stories, and their journeys toward body positivity and body acceptance. And that's really become the focus of my work as an intuitive eating counselor in recent years is really helping people, you know, implement body acceptance and ditch the diet mentality and really sort of trust their bodies to guide them in this intuitive eating practice. So that's, you know, my professional background. My personal background is that years ago I had my own eating disorder history and had sort of a winding path to recovery. And I was also a food writer. I started out as a food journalist. So my careers as a food journalist and then later as a dietitian kind of dovetailed in this podcast that I do. And that's kind of where I have my journalistic hat on. But I also talk about, you know, the things that are coming up in my work with clients one-on-one and my online intuitive eating course. Um, and I get to really sort of you know, dig into those issues. So very yeah. cool. Yeah. Highly recommend checking out her podcast. I'll include a link in the show notes because it's fabulous. Thank and you. for people that, you know, you said a bunch of awesome words there, like body <laughs> acceptance, health at every size, there's lots going on that maybe a lot of people aren't familiar with. Why don't we t- um, bite off the health at every size piece? Because it can be a really overwhelming, even when you say that. I know when I first heard health at every size. I was like, no. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So uh, there was a question that came in. I'll start with that one first. It was, what's the difference between overweight and actually having an unhealthy amount of body fat? And where does health at every size come into all of this? I feel like it's a cop out for people that don't want to put the work in. Great question. And I will say that I definitely identify with that because when I first heard the term health at every size, I had that same reaction. Mm -hmm. So, you know, then I I started to dig into the research and really learn about, you know, I came to my perspective as a health at every size dietitian through treating people who are recovering from eating disorders. And that is where the health at every size literature has become really integrated into practice in a lot of ways where the research really shows that people can't intentionally lose weight and keep it off for any significant length of time. You know, we know that there's that statistic that gets thrown around that 95% of diets fail. Um, Some more recent research suggests it's even higher, like 98, 99%. And the issue is that a lot of studies will show some weight loss in the short term, like one to two years from doing a, a typical diet. But then, you know, five or 10 years down the line, people generally gain the weight back and oftentimes will gain even more in the process. So health at every size is partly born out of this idea that like, okay, weight loss doesn't actually work. Intentional weight loss doesn't actually work as it's supposed to. And we've seen that people tend to get less healthy the more they weight cycle or, you know, it's commonly called yo-yo dieting. In the medical research, it's called weight cycling. And it's where people lose and gain a significant amount of weight again and again over many years or even, you know, a few years. And weight cycling has been independently associated with a lot of negative health outcomes. And interestingly, they're the ones that are typically associated with quote unquote overweight and quote unquote obesity. And I use those terms in quotes for a reason. We can kind of sidebar that and come back to it. But these diseases that we see that are associated with weight cycling are like diabetes, heart disease, high blood pressure, like all these things that, you know, people typically associate with being at a higher weight. It turns out that the reason they're associated with being at a higher weight is likely because people who are at a higher weight have weight cycled more in their lives than people who are already at a lower weight. And weight cycling also tends to drive people's weight up over time. So Mm -hmm. that research is all kind of in, you know, is all kind of the backdrop to health at every size and health at every size says like, okay, weight, weight loss doesn't work. Intentional weight loss doesn't work. Weight cycling makes people less healthy. Is there a way that we can make people more healthy without focusing on weight loss wherever they're at? And then whatever happens to their weight in the process is what it is. And so that's the approach of health at every size is like, yes, actually your behaviors, your relationship with food, your exercise, your fitness level, like all of that stuff does actually have a bearing on health independent of weight. And that's why we get these things like the quote obesity paradigm 
paradox or the quote fat and fit phenomenon where there are people who are actually in larger bodies and who are very metabolically healthy and very fit and like able to do things and not constrained by their size in any way. So, you know, the goal with health at every size is to say whatever your weight coming in, let's help you get healthier and, you know, engage in healthier behaviors wherever you're at. And sometimes that means people do end up losing weight along the way. Sometimes that means people end up gaining weight along the way because they were restricting and engaging in, you know, unhealthy, an unhealthy relationship with food to get them into a smaller body. So what is necessary for their health is actually to gain weight. And then some people just maintain their weight because, you know, they were already at a stable weight for them. Mm, yeah, I think the key, the the thing that really took it home, I think I was Jess Baker's book when she was talking about health at every size. Um, mm-hmm. And she said, it's about healthy behaviors, guys. And I was driving, listening to the audiobook, and I had to stop and pull over. And I was like, oh, my gosh, I finally get it. It's <laughs> not about like some excuse or anything. It's just about creating like positive, healthy behavior, because when you're in that weight loss dieting structure it's like you're constantly counting and tracking and all all of the crazy things and your mind is muddled with all this stuff and maybe you're pushing yourself too hard and you're going to the gym all the time and you don't even like it um your husband's having a conversation you're not even listening because you're counting how many calories you had like those that that was my life (laughs) and it just, those are all unhealthy behaviors and made me live in a body that I didn't love in a life that I wasn't experiencing. So what are some of those, like you mentioned a couple of the healthy behaviors, what are some healthy behaviors within the health at every size structure? Yeah. So that's where intuitive eating comes in because intuitive eating is sort of the model of relating to food in a health at every size way. And the, the, you know, health at every size and intuitive eating were sort of independently evolved disciplines, but they've come together really nicely because intuitive eating is kind of the way to support health at every size nutritionally. So intuitive eating is about getting back in touch with your body's natural cues about hunger and fullness, but also using satisfaction and pleasure to guide you in your food choices and, you know, really taking away those food restrictions and rules, like those things that, you know, you said, like you get so fixated on like counting calories or I can't eat this or I ate this. So I now I need to compensate with that or, you know, compensate with this exercise at the gym, you know, using food and fitness in this really instrumental way rather than using food to nourish yourself and also help, you know, give yourself pleasure and enjoyment and learning to trust your body ultimately about your food decisions. Because I think when we're stuck in the diet mentality, the diet mentality tells us, you know, the diet industry really tells us that Mm -hmm. we can't be trusted with food. We can't trust our bodies to make the right decisions. We have to give up our um, control to some, you know, higher force, whether that's whatever diet plan is being sold to us or whatever guru is, you know, on TV talking about the latest supplement or whatever. And we're, we're told to like abdicate our trust to someone else. And then if we try, if we've been dieting for a while and we try to trust our bodies again, and we're like, okay, this diet thing clearly isn't working. I'm going to give up and try to listen to my body. Usually what the body does when it's been in a restricted state for a long time is it's like, cool, gimme, gimme, all the treats, all the things that I've been deeming off limits, all the sweets, et cetera. And so it sort of reinforces this notion like, see, I can't be trusted because when I try to take the, you know, take the reins off, I end up eating nothing but cookies. So clearly I need some kind of diet to give me structure. Like that's the mentality that we're sort of all stuck in when we're when we're in this diet mentality. So intuitive eating says like, Yes, that's a clear, we actually have science showing that that is a natural response to restriction and deprivation, that your body will kind of go through that phase. But if you can get through it and you can really break down and let go more of the restrictions, you know, keep letting go even when it's uncomfortable, eventually you get to a place where you really do like stop eating those foods because you want to, not because you feel like you have to, you know, you start making choices from a more balanced place because it feels good in your body and it's self-care, not self-control. So that's like my big catchphrase with intuitive eating. If I'm like giving a super quick pitch for it, I'm like, it's about self-care, not self-control because you know, we're all conditioned to think I need to control myself around food. I need to have discipline and willpower. And intuitive eating says, no, you actually don't. You have a built in 
you know, meter for all of that stuff. We're all born knowing how to eat intuitively, knowing how to nourish ourselves well. And all we have to do is get through the diet mentality and really work out a lot of these things that have been kind of placed on us, including body shame and, you know, weight based discrimination, you know, get through those things and get back to this essential nature that we all have, which is being able to intuitively decide what feels good to us, what feels nourishing and, you know, how hungry and full we are at any time. Yeah, I can definitely attest to when I said like, screw this dieting thing, I'm just going to eat whatever I want when I want. There was a large period where I ate all of the things. <laughs> like, I just <laughs> couldn't too. even, I couldn't even. But oh, me too. when you get over that hump, it's like, everything is kind of free to eat whatever you want to eat whenever you want to eat it. And then it becomes, and I love that self-care, not self-control, like not controlling yourself, but rather caring for yourself. And once I got over that hump of eating all the things, I was like, wow, okay, well, I know I really don't like this. I don't really enjoy this. This doesn't really feel good in my body, but this does. And so just navigating and creating an eating style that worked well for me. And it, and the other thing is like, it changes. Like mm -hmm. there are months where, oh, for instance, I made a pork steak over the weekend and even the smell of it made me nauseous. So I was like, Kate, nope, don't do pork steaks anymore. <laughs> like, and that's just, that's just the way it goes. It's not a big deal. But, uh, the, the thing that I loved most about what you mentioned is listening to your body and knowing that we all need something a little bit different. So you talked about like the gurus and people out there saying like, this is the golden ticket. I think if anyone says like, all you have to do is follow this a hundred percent and you'll be great. And if you don't do it right, you'll fail. And that's why it didn't work is scary. And you probably mm -hmm. shouldn't be associated with that because <laughs> every body is different. Yeah, I completely agree. And I think like my goal as an intuitive eating coach is really to make myself obsolete, you know, for mm -hmm. any given individual. I would love to get to a point where like you can do it yourself. You know, your body is back in charge and I have facilitated that. And then I can step out of the way and be like, go forth and, you know, do it yourself because that's what we're all really born knowing how to do. And that's, that's our birthright really, you know, yeah, really it is before you mentioned, um, step, uh, getting into your body and, and really feeling your body. Do you have tools or tips on how one could even think about doing that? <laughs> yeah, it's so tough. And it, it takes it takes time, you know, and it takes like opening up to it as well. Because I know from my own experience, and that of many of my clients and my podcast listeners as well, like, if you're not ready for it, you're just gonna either do it in a way that confirms your negative beliefs, or you're going to sort of push it away and be like, that'll never work for me. Mm -hmm. So I think the first step before even doing anything is just sort of, you know, pondering like what it would be like to do it, you know, think about, I mean, I think my podcast, I, one of the things that I like to do with that is just put out there information for people to digest and explore and think about in their own time. And they don't have to do anything with it right away. But you know, to just let that simmer on the back burner, and maybe eventually you'll be able to make a change. So, you know, first step is contemplation, really. And then I think the next step I would say is, I really like to focus on two things, two of the core principles of intuitive eating, which are getting rid of the diet mentality or rejecting, ditching the diet mentality, whatever you want to say. And honoring your hunger. Because I think mm. when people come to intuitive eating, oftentimes the way it's sold in like weight loss culture is, oh, intuitive eating is a way to like stop when you're full so you won't gain weight and you'll actually lose weight, <laughs> you know? And that's not what it is. Like, yes, you will stop when you're full eventually. But I think the first step towards that is honoring your hunger. And we all have so many barriers towards honoring our hunger and even experiencing our hunger if we've been steeped in diet culture for a long time. Because, you know, if you think about it, diets trick you into like eating something that's not really satisfying when you're hungry to take the edge off and doing that again and again all the time or getting into a state of, you know, semi-starvation really where eventually your body is crying out for nourishment so much that it drives you to binge and, you know, that kind of primal hunger where you feel like you can't control yourself around food. So the first step is really like getting back in touch with hunger, what that even feels like, what the subtle levels of hunger feel like 
like. I think for a lot of chronic dieters that I see, they'll be in touch with hunger at the very extreme levels, like very hungry and you know a 10 on the hunger scale or very full and not at all hungry. But what about that you know, mid range where it's like, oh, it's it's probably time to think about getting some food. What would I like? What sounds good right now? You know, a lot of people sort of skip over that part and miss the part where they could actually be making like more considered and self care based decisions because they're like, I'm not hungry. I'm not hungry. I'm not hungry. You know, like mm-hmm. trying to trying to convince themselves that they, they, they don't really feel anything. And in fact, you know, there are signals that your body's giving you. So I will say that if someone has an active eating disorder or has had an eating disorder for a while, especially binging and purging or severe restricting, your hunger cues are going to be really out of whack. And sometimes this doesn't work. You know, this really can't work until you've had the nutritional rehabilitation period Mm -hmm. of like eating enough at regular intervals so that your body gets trained as to what is appropriate amounts of food and, you know, types of foods. So usually with like, you know, sort of conventional eating disorder treatment, the model is to go on a meal plan. And I I do that for my clients. Like anyone who sees me with an active eating disorder, I'll usually give them a meal plan that's designed to mimic what their body's actually going to be telling them eventually in terms of how frequently to eat, how much to eat, you know, sort of what a baseline like normal amount of food is so that they can just start getting back in touch with those cues. And then eventually when you recover enough from an eating disorder to where you're not like significantly engaging in behaviors all the time, you can start to actually feel your hunger. But I would say don't, you know, if anyone's listening who has an active eating disorder and is thinking about trying this, I would say don't necessarily go into intuitive eating right now. Try to get nutritionally rehabilitated first. I think that that's really good advice. I had bulimia for many, many, many years. And I've been like, I call it sober (laughs) for 480 (laughs) days of like no eating disorder patterns. And I know that that rehabilitation portion took me like a really long time, (laughs) like Mm -hmm. a really long time. Good for you. That's awesome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's, it's really cool to be you know, on the other side of it and seeing things the way, like the way that they actually are and, and having positive reinforcement and also understanding emotions and hunger cues. And you're right, like those hunger cues, when you're coming from a history of an eating disorder and mine lasted a very, very, very long time with multiple different layers. It's interesting now to like know when I'm hungry and feel that hunger. Like you said, stages one through 10, you can feel like I'm a little bit hungry. Whereas before, like there was no, there was zero signals. So I think whether you've, you know, have a history of an eating disorder, even like you said, that diet mentality, your hunger signals are a little bit wonky when you're, when you're actually trying to listen for those listening. One thing that I love to do to try to connect to my body in the moment. And I think I've talked about this in other podcasts is doing like a little, um, body meditation. So I like look at my hands and kind of think of all the things my hands have done for me and, and really get into just connecting to my body and looking at like one part and just focusing on it. And sometimes that can help me get into my own body instead of thinking of rules and details and where I should be and what I should be doing. And if I have plans and if I need to eat and all the craziness that comes along when you get outside of your body. So that might be helpful for those listening. I love that. Yeah, that actually was really helpful for me too. doing like mindfulness exercises and mind body sort of exercises, Mm. including gentle yoga, you know, the body scan meditation where you go through and like you said, think with gratitude about different parts of your body or just even sort of try to reflect neutrally on different parts of your body. If you're like really steeped in body shame, sometimes even gratitude Mm. is a step too far, you know? Totally. Yeah. I can't even be thankful for it. You know, yeah. Baby steps. (laughs) Baby steps. Been there. Which, yeah, (laughs) is totally something that I encourage with this because I think one of the things that, you know, when people hear health at every size and they're like, ah, no, it's an excuse. I think one of the things that is going on with that reaction is that, you know, it, it feels like completely giving up everything you know to be true and like 
diving into this alternate universe. You know, it feels very black and white. So really recovery and getting out of the diet mentality is such a spectrum and such a continuum. And like, it also took me a good 10 years, I would say, to get mm. fully recovered from my eating disorder. So it's, I know what a journey it can be. And if you're not there immediately, that's okay. Just try to open the door to the possibility. You know? Oh yeah, totally. I'm going on nine years. So like it, mm-hmm. it takes a while and it's not like a quick fix, but like you said, it's not just like snap your fingers and then like you're good to go. But the process in and of itself is so fulfilling. Vital Proteins is a partner of the Keto Diet Podcast, and we all know how much I'm obsessed with them. Why? Because their beef gelatin and collagen peptides are so versatile, encourage healing, and are very easy to incorporate. If you have digestive imbalances, are wanting to grow strong hair or nails, or are looking for a health-promoting protein powder, look no further than Vital Proteins. Their beef gelatin is great added to soups, stews, and casseroles, and their collagen peptides can be used just like you would use protein powder. Now that the weather is changing, I like to add a couple of scoops of gelatin to my casseroles, stews, and my personal favorite beef stroganoff. Receive 10% off plus free shipping in the US when you use the code VPHP10 at checkout at vitalproteins.com. So speaking about like fulfilling and feeling happy with one's body, I'm sure body acceptance plays a role in intuitive eating, health at every size. How does one navigate body image and body acceptance? Yeah, that's a huge, very important question. So I think that, you know, I mean, I guess I'll speak in sort of philosophical terms and maybe in, then in practical terms. Yeah. I think in, in philosophical terms, it's really so necessary for the process of intuitive eating and health at every size to do the body acceptance work because if there's part of you, and of course there will still be part of you that, that wants to lose weight with mm-hmm. us, right? Like you can't jump from diet mentality to no weight loss thoughts overnight, but I think doing the work to drop that part of you and, and, you know, decrease the power of its voice is so important because if that voice is in control, then your body can't be in control. You know, if, if the voice of you have to lose weight and if you eat that, you're not going to, or if you, you know, you're too hungry and you can't trust your hunger or what are you doing still eating? You should be full by now. You know, if all of those sort of critical thoughts are driving the bus, then you're never going to get to a place of intuitive eating and health at every size. So you really have to work to put that voice in its place. And I think some practical tools you can do to get there are journaling, which is a hugely helpful, it was a very helpful part of my practice mm-hmm. and of a lot of the clients I see. It's just journal exercise that's very helpful in sort of rewiring your brain to not go down those negative thought patterns, but to sort of substitute more positive ones, which is something that the eating disorder therapist Carolyn Costin developed. It's called eating disorder self, healthy self, but with, you know, diet based thoughts, I call it like diet mentality, self and healthy self. And basically it's writing down those criticisms, writing down the negative thoughts that the diet mentality is telling you. Like those things I just said, you know, if you eat this, you're going to get fat. If you're fat, no one's going to love you. You know, all the horrible things that are really untrue that our minds often tell us. And then on the other side of the page or below those thoughts, writing down, you know, channeling your healthy self, which is really your intuition, that wise part of you that sees beyond these rules and restrictions and self-criticisms to what's really true and what's really possible. So, you know, it's going to be tough at first. And sometimes it feels like you're going through the motions. But if you can just write back from like, you know, if I could even hear my healthy self right now, what would it say to me? Or what would, you know, my dietitian, my dietitian say to me? Or what would, you know, someone that I trust and love say to me Mm. about this? And it might be, of course, you know, we're going to love you at whatever size your body ends up. You're worthy of love, no matter what body you have, you know, and if you eat this food, you're not going to automatically get fat, you're going to be nourishing yourself and developing a deeper connection with your body that will ultimately help you get to whatever size you're meant to be, you know, so just kind of 
practicing that, which I know might sound kind of cheesy if you're not believing those things to begin with, but there is actually research that doing that helps to rewire your brain to think differently and to go down different automatic thought patterns. And it's not just like stopping the thought and saying, no, shut up. You know, it's Mm -hmm. saying like, okay, I acknowledge and I see what this part of my brain is telling me. What does this other part say in response? So it's like letting that part of you be there, not shaming yourself for having those diet mentality thoughts, but then also, you know, bringing in this wise part of your mind to respond and to say, hey, maybe you could see it differently though. Or is is what you're saying automatically true? I don't think so. Here's a, here's a reason why not. I love that. And those negative thoughts and those, the dieting you, that version of yourself, that's dieting mentality. Um, when those thoughts, even today, they come up like often, like you can't Mm -hmm. always have them go away completely. But I always ask that negative voice, like what, what, what are you trying to protect me from? Like what, what, what are you trying to accomplish by saying these things? And oftentimes it's like a fear of not being loved or feeling unworthy. And then I'm like, okay, well, what are things that I can do to make myself feel worthy and loved so that, you know, this voice, like I get what you're saying. That's totally cool. I respect Mm -hmm. that, but I'm going to go in this different direction. (laughs) And like you said, choose to nourish my body. And I can attest to when I was recovering and even getting out of the diet mentality and creating my own eating style, I would always say when I was eating out loud or in my head, I'm nourishing my body. I'm nourishing my body. I'm nourishing my body. And I literally repeated it over and over and over until I was done my meal. (laughs) (laughs) I love that. (laughs) And hey, like now I don't even think about it. And it's like, you're so right. It totally changes the track of your mind and it's not an issue. Um, Yeah. But what happens when you're on this boat of like, okay, I'm going to do this self-love thing and I'm going to, you know, add in healthy behaviors, but there's people external from you that because you are quote unquote overweight, they perceive you as being unhealthy. And how do you continue to care for yourself when people external to you are like, but you're not caring for yourself, you're fat. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, that is such a great question. And again, I think, you know, it's it's a many layered mm. sort of thing because it's true that in our society, it's profoundly body negative. And we, you know, there's tons of research to date showing that the body mass index categories aren't actually a good predictor of health and mm-hmm. should be thrown out, like that doctors should not be using them. And yet many doctors tend to cling to this outdated science because either they don't know or they don't believe or you know, they have a lot of biases of their own, preventing them from accepting the new science. And so, you know, they say, well, you need to lose weight because you're at risk for diabetes or whatever. Or your family says, like, you're clearly not taking care of yourself and we're worried about you and you need to lose weight. You know, so that is such a reality to be expected in our society. Mm -hmm. And I think to counter that is, it's important to be sort of solid in your own place with it. And to do that, I think finding a community of other body positive people, whether that's online or in person, is really a huge part of this process. So, you know, online, I think a huge thing you can do is to unfollow and unsubscribe from people who trigger you, Mm -hmm. you know, whether that's like friends and family posting about their latest weight loss challenge, just like quietly unfollow on Facebook, they won't even know you did it you know, or unsubscribe from the people trying to sell you diets that are making you feel like you should be losing weight and surround yourself with body positive content, body positive media, because there are tons and tons of people out there now putting this stuff out into the world. I've had many of them on my podcast, but like you can find them through like the hashtag body positive on Instagram or Twitter is a great way to search. Refinery 29 does a lot of great body positive media. Mm -hmm. And so you can kind of just like look around and start to see, oh, there are these people out there living their lives in this profoundly different way than I was and who are actually healthy and happy and have lives and all the things that I want, you know, have relationships, have love, have financial success, like have a life that is worth emulating. And I think that is so important to see as a counter to the messages we always get in the media about like, you have to be thin to be happy, you have to look a certain way, you you know, you're not going to achieve these things without having this body. That's just patently untrue. Yeah. And and then I think, you know, in terms of like talking to the individuals in your lives, that's a kind of a challenging conversation. And I would say, you know, definitely 
try approaching that with people you trust and that you feel you could have that sort of empathic connection with. A good place to start for resources around that is Linda Bacon's website, lindabacon.org. And Linda Bacon's book, she wrote a book called Health at Every Size that is kind of like the Bible of Health at Every Size or mm-hmm. the, you know, the first major book to come out sort of detailing the research behind it and the principles. And then she co-wrote a book more recently called Body Respect with Lucy Affermore, who's a dietitian. And that's like a more condensed sort of more digestible version of health at every size with like very action oriented kind of principles. So those two books might be a good thing to to read for yourself to get grounded in these philosophies. And then, you know, to share with people in your life who might be receptive to them. Yeah. And I mean, it's everywhere. Like, Mm -hmm. I know I had to do like a purge of all of the people that I follow and Instagram accounts and Facebook accounts. It just made me feel like I wasn't a good human unless I was eating X amounts of calories a day and fitting into certain genes that they were selling. (laughs) And (laughs) I just, I ain't got time for that. Like, imagine all of the energy you spend on all of these things that like take you away from living your life. And that was the big turning point for me is like, I, I just want to live my life in my body because this is really the only thing I have that's keeping me on this earth. So I better like love it because without it, I don't get to experience all the things that I do love. And I think there's, there's also a conversation around judging others Oftentimes, like when you're going through, I would imagine when you're going through this health at every size and body acceptance, I know that we had a question come in from one of the listeners that said, um, you know, if, if we're trying to love ourselves, how do we stop judging others? Because I think it's silently how I judge myself. Mm. Yeah. It's so interrelated, right? Like, yes how we speak to ourselves is sometimes how we relate to others or, or judge them in our minds. And I think to that point, like self-compassion and compassion for others is a huge piece of this. So like something that was really helpful in my practice and my recovery was just learning to apply compassion to myself to start giving up the control and the really detrimental restrictions that I was placing on myself and having compassion for like, you need to eat more, you need to be nourished, you need to be able to have pleasure and, you know, flexibility around food to enjoy your life. And that really caused a profound shift in how I related to food and my body over time. Again, it wasn't overnight, but, you know, having a regular self-compassion practice and a therapist who um, really encouraged that and worked with me on that was a huge piece of the puzzle. And through self-compassion, I was able to to start to connect compassion to other people too and start to offer that out into the world. Because I think it's kind of a two-way street when we start to have compassion for others. We sometimes can start to feel more compassionate toward ourselves. And when we start to feel more compassionate toward ourselves, we can identify that common humanity in others. So I think it's, it's a really you know, important process to go through that, to work through your own judgments about yourself. And I would say for a lot of people, it tends to work better when they do that first, you know, Mm -hmm. working through your own self judgments and like, why is this, why is this so important to you? You know, why is someone's body size so meaningful to you? It's probably because you have your own associations with that, your own beliefs about what would it mean if I was that size? What would happen to mm-hmm. me? You know, how how would I be rejected or unloved or not fit in? You know, these are very common themes that come up for people in like thinking about body negativity. And then, you know, once you kind of can get compassionate with yourself around that and create like a a nest of self-compassion for these other things to flourish, then I think it's really important to start looking at the social justice social justice aspect of health at every size, which is that you know, we really don't have any known way to help people or make people lose weight and keep it off in a sustainable way. The things that people at higher weights do to try to lose weight actually make them unhealthier or really people at any weight do to make them, you know, lose weight, make them unhealthier. So like, how are we not just accepting that some people are meant to be at a larger (laughs) size and maybe that's what's healthy for them, you know, and it's actually the last bastion of discrimination in many cases, even among very progressive people who believe in equality for all races, all genders, all sexual orientations, all ethnicities, you know, 
there's still this piece of discrimination against people in larger bodies. And again, from a self-compassionate place, I think you not you need to not beat yourself up over this because in our society it's so common. But from a self-compassionate place, look at like, why is it that I'm holding on to this discrimination? Would I feel comfortable thinking the same things about a person with a different color skin than me? So why am I thinking these things about a person in a larger body than me or in a body that, you know, just looks different from mine? in some way right yeah I mean when you say it like that it's like (laughs) I mean you can't argue that and I actually just finished making like a bunch of videos and in one of them I talked about that very thing of just like it's it's okay for your body to be different and it's okay to accept that like your body is different just like we look different you can't expect us all to have the same body shape. And if I wanted to be a size zero, I'd literally have to cut one of my hips off. Like, <laughs> like there's no right. other way to get around that. Like I just, I have big hips. Even when I was a kid, my hairdresser called me computer hips because they are just, oh. like, it was horrible. It was horrible. Oh my God. But that was yeah. that like, I just had big hips and these hips don't lie. Like they can only go to a certain size. And, and so, yeah, when you say like race or gender or when you apply that it's it's very true so as somebody who's maybe let's say parents because I know that there's some parents listening and they're wondering like what can I do for my children so that this you know I set them up in a way that they can love and accept their bodies and see that there is media out there that will tell them that they shouldn't trust their bodies or what are things that I can do as a parent to ensure that my child has good values when it comes to their body Great question. Yeah. I think the first thing is not to not to ever say anything to kids about their bodies that could be construed as critical or shaming or even praising like, you know, praising someone for their size or for how their body looks can also sometimes be used in service of an eating disorder without the parent even intending that because kids get the message like, oh, I'm valued for my looks. I'm valued for how Mm -hmm. my body is. So I better keep that or I better do more of that, you know, so really kind of taking the emphasis off off of how your child looks and putting the emphasis more on, you know, what their body can do and showing them the cool things that it's possible for bodies to do. Like, wow, you know, we just walked across that whole, you know, field or whatever. Isn't that cool? Or we can, you know, let's go play ball or let's go ride bikes or, you know, getting them involved in sports or something to kind of like give them a sense of joy in movement and in using their bodies to whatever, you know, capacity and abilities they have and also in ways that they love. So letting them sort of gravitate towards the styles of movement that make them happy, which might mean, you know, something different than what you feel is is appropriate or something. And then also, you know, around food, just giving them an, a lot of options and a lot of good modeling around balance and a neutral relationship with food and having a lot of things available, both, you know, nourishing balanced meals and also fun foods. So not making like sugar off limits in your house not making anything off limits in your house and having fun different things occasionally so that they know like oh sometimes we get this candy and sometimes we get these chips and like it's all on the table and they can learn to relate to them in a neutral way because I can't tell you how many clients I've seen who grew up in a household where there were no treats allowed there was no sugar at all and it was like they developed this binge pattern when they would go over to friends houses where so and so has a candy drawer and I'm going to spend all my time just eating snacks at that house and not Mm -hmm. really spending time with my friends, you know, like it, it becomes this forbidden fruit if you have something off limits and kids really know, you know, once they start interacting with other kids, they pick up on what's available out there, what kinds of foods are other kids getting and the kids that get the variety of foods and get to develop a neutral relationship with every type of food really don't show that same compulsiveness around it. They can take or leave their candy drawer. You know, usually the kid with the candy drawer in their house is like, oh yeah, that old thing, you know, maybe I'll have some, maybe I won't like forget about it, you know? Mm Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, I was the girl who ate li- literally an entire garbage bag of popcorn when I went over to a friend's house mm. because I wasn't no treats. And my mom even mentioned it the other day. She's like, wasn't it great that we didn't have any treats in the house? And I was like, mom, you have no <laughs> idea how horrible that was <laughs> because it's true. It creates binge tendencies for sure. To get back to the social piece in a podcast, I can't remember one of your podcasts, you were talking about the socially accepted aspects of disordered behaviors around food and how it's socially acceptable to you know count calories or skip a meal or you know whatever the case may be um Mm -hmm. to get back to the social piece what are some of the disordered behaviors around food Mm, that's a great question and yeah it's really we live in such a culture, our culture is so steeped in the diet mentality that it's really hard to recognize sometimes. Mm. So it is that thing of counting calories or compensating for a meal, like thinking, oh, well, I ate X thing earlier in the day. So I need to not eat, you know, like I had a carb with lunch, so I shouldn't have a carb with dinner or even though I want it, or even though it's, you know, part of the meal that someone is serving me or whatever, or, you know, I I really want this thing, but I'm going to seek out a substitute that's lower in whatever nutrient because I've had too much of that, you know, so like the low fat version of the thing you really want, you know, so all of those little things that are like women's magazine diet tips, basically, if you flip through any women's magazine, actually, that are that's on the stands today, you'll probably see some great examples of disordered eating. So a big one today is clean eating. Um, oh, that yeah. is, you know, that it literally is moralizing about food. It's clean versus, dirty? they don't say it, but dirty <laughs> is the, yeah, it's like, that's the flip side here. You know, so what are, who are you if you're eating dirty, right? You don't want to be that person. You want to be clean. And, you know, it's not to say that like, you know, whole foods and plant-based and greens and vegetables aren't great. They are. But if you're only focusing on those things and you're demonizing all other foods and, you know, telling yourself you're bad for eating them or that like you broke your diet and you have to get back tomorrow, that is setting up a really disordered relationship with food. So, you know, it's really true that all foods fit. And I didn't believe that when I first started down the road of becoming a dietitian. I did not believe that all foods fit in a healthy diet or a Mm -hmm. balanced lifestyle. I thought, yeah, but there are certain foods that are just bad and that you should never have. Mm -hmm. And I've realized that that was a limiting belief that kept me locked in a very disordered mindset where like if I did choose a food that I deemed bad because I had to, I was like, oh, I feel so terrible. Like I need to, you know, exercise to burn this off or, oh, my gut is just reacting so badly to this. And it would almost make it feel worse in my gut. Yeah. Then, Mm -hmm. you know, now I really have no restrictions around food. I don't demonize anything. And on those rare occasions when I have to go to like a fast food drive through on a road trip, I'll be like, okay, cool. That was good. Like now I can move on. And, you know, we got our eating done so that we can keep going on this trip. It doesn't hold that same stigma. And, you know, it allows me to just have a lot more flexibility and fun in my life. And my health has never been better. So, you know, it really is, has been borne out by my personal experience. And I've seen it in hundreds of clients as well, that, you know, people's health can be so compromised by trying to follow whatever diet they're trying to follow. And especially with this clean eating thing, because I think it causes people to really fixate. It causes people often to way over consume vegetables and fruits because those things can be eaten in too high amounts. Mm -hmm. They give you a lot of gas and stomach pain if you eat too many of them. So, you know, it's like, we got to stop compromising our health for the sake of following some perfect diet. We got to just be cool and flexible around food and recognize that all foods can fit. Because if you can really accept like all foods fit and nothing makes me bad, then you can tune into like, okay, but what really tastes good? What do I really want? And what will I choose if I have to in a pinch, but that's not like my favorite, you know? 
Mm -hmm. And that's really where creating your own eating style comes in. I'm sure, you know, Mm -hmm. that was my process of like, now that I understand like all, yes, definitely all foods, foods fit, which ones feel best for me, which ones give me acne. I don't really enjoy having acne. So like I avoid those foods because I don't like the acne, but that's a choice that I make. And if I eat that food, like tomatoes, I love tomatoes, but they give me, they mess up my complexion. So when I eat Mm -hmm. them, I'm like, ah, shoot. Okay. Well it was tasty, but it's not not like all of a sudden everything's cut out and I'm not going to eat these things because I think that there is a space for, you know, once you get over the, the hump of intuitive eating and you've eaten all the things and you're doing body acceptance and you're listening to your body, there's going to be foods that you like, don't like that make you feel good that maybe give you headaches. And then you get to choose, do I want a headache or do I want this thing? And sometimes mm-hmm. I choose the headache cause I want the thing, but it's a, it's a choice that you make instead of being told that's bad, that's good, you eat this sort of rigmarole. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's, you know, really puts the ball back in your court Mm. if you can liberate yourself from those rules because someone devised those rules based on like either their personal experience, usually some very limited research that was not reflective of the years of research that followed. They kind of glommed onto one study to create Mm -hmm. a diet plan um, or some combination of the two, you know? And so like you actually have to figure out what works for your body because what one guru says might not be the thing that works for you. And the you know, large body of nutrition research that we have shows that all foods really do fit. There is no one magic diet that's going to, you know, solve all your health problems and that being too rigid about a diet can actually make you have health problems you never had before, like an eating disorder. Diets really set you up for eating disorders. That's been shown in the research. So, you know, it pays to be flexible about food because then you really do get to be in charge. You're in charge of your own body, you know. The Keto Diet Podcast is excited to be partnered with Primal Kitchen, the makers of uncompromisingly delicious, high-quality, nutrient-dense, real food products that are also non-GMO and paleo-approved. In the world of real food eating, it's what you put on your food that keeps it interesting. And food that's good for you tastes even better with Primal Kitchen foods. And they've just come out with a dairy-free, keto-friendly ranch dressing that you can slather on just about everything. Using 100% pure avocado oil as a base, their ranch dressing includes only the finest functional and health food ingredients like nutritional yeast, apple cider vinegar, organic garlic, onion, dill, cage-free organic eggs, black pepper, and chives. Stock up on all Primal Kitchen goods by visiting healthfulpursuit.com forward slash primal and entering the coupon code FAT that's all in caps, no spaces, for 15% off your entire order. And so how do you determine, like you mentioned, I'm healthier now than I ever have been? How do you determine health if weight isn't the thing that's determining your health? Great question. What is the marker? I mean, it's, you know, I think mental health is a huge component of overall health, right? So I think that is a big piece of it is that I'm no longer ruled by food rules. I am flexible around food. I only think about food like five or six times a day when I'm hungry. And then the rest of the time I'm doing other things and focusing on my life and the things that bring me joy and food brings me joy too, but it's not like the sole focus of my day or Mm -hmm. taking me away from the other things that bring me joy. And then, you know, in terms of physical health, like, I mean, when I had my eating disorder, it went on undiagnosed for a long time. And during that period, I lost my period. I didn't have a period for over a year. I had acne. I had really high anxiety. I was depressed. I was ruminating about food all the time. You know, Mm -hmm. what else? Oh, I had like night sweats. Like there were just all these little things that I was like, and you know, my, you know, my mind at the time was so focused on, well, what's the food I can cut out? What's the thing that I can restrict to make this all better? Mm -hmm. Cause the answer can't possibly be restrict less. You know, that was, I was not like having La 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 la, not listening. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Cause there are people in my life telling me that. 
me too. I was like, nope, <laughs> I will not hear you. Yeah. So yeah, so it was like, you know, what's the what's the magic bullet here? And I seized on gluten because I was like, you know, this was yeah. back in 2003 when it was not even a trend yet, but there was some emerging research and the sort of hippie crunchy friends that I had were like, oh, have you heard about gluten? So, you know, that's that was the thing I grabbed onto. And sure enough, cutting out gluten just made everything worse, not mm -hmm. better because then I was also obsessing about this thing and now restricting and binging on gluten-free foods too. And so, you know, it really, I think I look back on that time in my life and I'm like, wow, you know, I've, I feel like I've come so far. My life feels so profoundly different. And, you know, all of the professional success that I've had, all of the mm. romantic um, happiness that I've found, all of the the friendships and connections that I have and, you know, my spiritual practice, like all of it came out of recovery. Like all of it would not have been possible without letting go of those restrictions and just letting myself be around food a little more and letting myself be around exercise, you know, so practicing only movement that makes me feel good rather than as punishment for something mm. I ate or, you know, a way to lose weight or compensation for something. So it's like, I just feel like my life has done a total 180 from that restrictive place. And that to me is the measure of health. It's, it's overall well being, you know, yeah, not a biomarker. You don't go to a lab and get a blood test. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Which, I mean, side note, a lot of people with health, at, you know, who pursue health at every size do see an improvement in biomarkers too. So like your cholesterol might go down if it was high or, you know, things like that. For me, the only real biomarkers were a hormonal imbalance caused by not having my period, which sure mm -hmm. enough cleared up when I stopped restricting and gained a little bit of weight, you know? So yeah. like... It'll do that. <laughs> it'll do that. <laughs> yeah, I had a mineral for eight years so it was mm. a long journey <laughs> but all it took was well all it took that's like oh so simple <laughs> just snap your fingers but right. yeah I was eating enough and I know that my body needs to be like quote unquote bigger in order to menstruate and to mm -hmm. me that's a sign of health when I feel like a woman every time it comes I'm like yes this is awesome thank you body whereas before I wasn't eating enough and That'll do it. <laughs> That'll do it. Yeah, yeah, women need an adequate amount of fat on our bodies to menstruate. And it's different for every woman because we all are genetically determined to have a certain amount of fat stores, just like we're genetically determined to have a certain height or a certain eye color or whatever. It's it's all very, very natural. Yes. And completely outside of BMI, because I agree mm -hmm. with you. Did you actually know that BMI was created by a mathematician in the 1800s? I did. Yes. I, I recently wrote something about that. I think it was for my online course. Yeah, I, it completely blew my mind Me when too. I found that out. <laughs> I was like, really? It was like a, a mathematics exercise. It was nothing yeah. to do with health at all. And then after World War II, they like picked it up because of insurance policies and stuff. And then it just snowballed from there. Mm hmm. An insurance company is the one that started using it for health purposes because yeah. they were like, I wonder how this would predict the health outcomes in our insurance pool. And it seemed to have some bearing, you know, in that particular population at the time. But the thing that is so crazy about it is that it it was deter it was like meant as a normal distribution of how body sizes are in the population. It's yeah. like we we sort of fall along this curve naturally as humans. And then, you know, it was arbitrarily decided to demonize these certain parts of the curve, you know, from quote unquote overweight on up. So yeah. that's why I put it in quotes, you know, overweight and obese, because the categories don't mean anything, especially like overweight. It's like over what weight? Over what? Why? Thing? Yeah. <laughs> right. Why is this, you know, over anything? Oh, Oftentimes. Crazy. And the people, you know, they've done now so much research around body mass index and health as to like whether it's actually useful at all and found A, no, and B, like paradoxically, the people in the quote overweight category seem to have the lowest mortality risk. They live the longest. And the people in the quote normal and quote obese categories have the same mortality risk as each other. So like, what are we doing saying that people who are in these quote overweight and quote obese categories need to lose weight to be healthy? You know, oh, makes no sense. Not none whatsoever. <laughs> like none. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show. Where can people find more from you? 
Yeah, thank you so much for having me. It's great talking with you. Yeah. People can find me at my website. It's christyharrison.com. And my podcast is called Food Psych. It's on iTunes or on my website at christyharrison.com slash food psych. And then I have an online intuitive eating course. If anyone wants to learn more about intuitive eating and is ready to really work through the principles. And that is at christyharrison.com slash course. Beautiful. Amazing. Well, I hope that everyone enjoyed today's episode and I will include the links, all the links that Christy mentioned in the show notes today, which you can find at healthfulpursuit.com forward slash podcast forward slash E5. And that does it for another episode of the Keto Diet Podcast. Thanks for listening in. You can follow me on Instagram by searching Healthful Pursuit, where you'll find daily keto eats and other fun things. And check out all of my keto supportive programs, bundles, guides, and other cool things over at healthfulpursuit.com forward slash shop. And I'll see you next Sunday. Bye.